Greetings and shalom. This is Adrian Scott and welcome to Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. Um, I have some more shekels for your thoughts, as it were. And this is one of those ones that yet again, I mean, I've kind of said I like to feel a little inspired um, doing these videos that something I usually it'll be something I hear or something I read and it'll kind of motivate me. And that's exactly what happened here. I was doing my nightly reading with my actually doing my uh, Torah portion with my wife and uh, the New Testament segment of our portion took us into the book of Matthew in chapter 22, where I kind of read across the section that it had for us and something jumped out at me that had not ever jumped out before. Now, I'm going to preface by saying this is just my take on it. I'm not saying this is gospel. Don't take it to the bank. I just asked a question. Let's put it this way. Could this be right? Could I be right about this? Just to entertain the idea. Could that be part, at least part of what this means? And so let me put my eyes on here and we'll actually do a little bit of reading. Now, again, it is Matthew chapter 22, starting right at the beginning of the chapter, yet another one of the parables of the Messiah. And uh, yeah, I'll just start reading here. So uh, at verse one begins, and Yeshua responded and spoke to them again by parables and said, the reign of the heavens is like a man, a sovereign who made a wedding feast for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come again. He sent out other servants saying, say to those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened cattle are slaughtered, and all is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they disregarded it and went their way. This one to his field, that one to his trade. And the rest, having seized his servants, insulted and killed them. But when the sovereign heard, he was wroth, and sent out his soldiers, destroyed those murderers, and set their city on fire. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast indeed is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the street corners and as many as you find invite to the wedding feast. And those servants went out into the street corners and gathered all whom they found, both wicked and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And when the sovereign came in to view the guests, he saw there a man who had not put on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the sovereign said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and throw him out into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So the two biggest points there that I wanted to make were that idea of you had the people that were invited. Could we call them mm, the natural branches, as Paul says in Roman 11? And they decided not to come. They were too busy with their worldly stuff. And they got themselves cut off of that natural tree, as Paul says in Romans 11. And then what did he do? He sent his servants out into the streets to gather the wild branches. I'm making a loose connection here so that they could be crafted into the wedding party, as it were. Um, and it really clarifies that when it says that the servants went out into the street corners in verse um, 10 here and gathered all whom they found, both wicked and good. All right. So that's the first big point is you have those who were properly invited, who just for their own reasons, not good ones, I would say, um, chose not to go. And then you had the wild branches, as it were, the Gentiles, the, 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 the riffraff <laughs> invited in from the street, both wicked and good, invited to the feast, right? So he's not making a separation. Let's fill it up. Let's get as many in here as we can. That sounds somewhat familiar. Now, this is the real crux of this, and this is the one that hit me. Um... When the sovereign came in to view the guests, he saw there a man who had not put on a wedding garment. And this man told him, 
He well, actually, he didn't tell him anything. He was speechless. And the sovereign at that point ordered for him to be bound hand and foot and thrown out into outer darkness. Right. This connects to something. It's a conversation I've had many times. I know Ray has had this a few times as well about this idea of sin. So the the loose question was, how much sin is, is too much sin, right? And I guess part of this maybe loosely connects to this argument of once saved, always saved, right? And I don't think that's the case. Um, but is there a way to explain that or justify that? And this is what I'm trying to get to here. So the wicked and the good, after the first invitees didn't come, were invited in. The wicked, the sinners were invited in. Did he go to all the sinners and say, get out, you're wicked, you're sinners, you don't belong here? No, he singled out one person and that was the one not wearing a wedding garment. So what makes that man different? I would argue he is probably part of that group of the wicked that were invited in. Um, but he wasn't wearing the wedding garment. That is, seems to be pretty clear in Yeshua's parable of what he's getting at is the fact that he was not wearing his wedding garment. What does that mean to me? And this is that question of, could this be right? Could I be onto something here? I'm just asking the question. I'm not saying this is the way it is. It's not a question of whether he was a sinner or not. He was, we're all sinners. He didn't care. He was unrepentant. He couldn't be bothered to put on the wedding garment because what does God say? He says, he's the one that searches out the hearts. That's what it's about. It's about your heart. So there can be a difference between you find yourself repeating a sin or committing new sins repeatedly. You're, we're sinners. You know, we're, we're sinners. That, that's the way it is. That's why we needed Yeshua to act on our behalf. Um, but there's, it's, you gotta, I gotta tread lightly here. I don't want I don't want this to come across the wrong way. Maybe a loose way to put it is there's a difference between repentant sin and unrepentant sin. So if you're sinning because your flesh is weak, maybe that's one thing. If you're sinning because you just don't care what God's word says, it's like, eh, enough with you. I'm going to do it anyway. What are you going to do about it? Right? Which is effectively this man who didn't even bother to put on a wedding garment. Right? Being invited to this wedding feast, he couldn't even bother to put on the clothes. He didn't care. He didn't care enough about the sovereign hosting this thing. He didn't care enough about the wedding party, about the people getting married, or anyone else there. He didn't care. He was completely unrepentant. He was just indifferent to the whole thing. I think the issue is more, the issue lies more in that. And I don't want to belabor the point too much, so I'll start wrapping it up here. But it's that idea of, yes, our, our flesh is weak. It is. I think there are sins that we can manage not to do, but, you know, we fall down. We fall down on a regular basis. And a lot of times it may even be a sin that you don't even realize is a sin. You know, and once you do, if you do at some point, you should be um, repentant of it, ask for forgiveness, right? Um, but I, I would, I would challenge the notion that if there's a sin you've committed and you don't know that it's a sin and you go to your grave not knowing it's a sin, I wonder if that would not be held accountable against you. You've got enough of a ledger as it is, I'm sure, of a list of sins. I, I entertain the idea. I would ask the question, that one, perhaps that one doesn't count because you didn't know it was a sin. Scripture does talk about when you sin involuntarily, you don't realize it's a sin, but then you realize that you've committed a sin. You're supposed to offer this offering and do this and that. So it more than the offering, it's the idea of, once you realize, but what happens, asking the question, what happens if you never realize? What if, just a what if question, right? If you realize at some point and you don't care enough to do anything to try to change it, or you don't feel repentant of it, despite the fact that your flesh is weak, 
then you're that guy who didn't bother to put in a, to put a wedding garment on. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. So maybe again, I ask the question or make the observation. Maybe there's a distinction that it's not that you're going to stop sinning once you become a believer, right? But you realize it's a sin. I think you should make some effort not to repeat that sin. But at the same time, the flesh is weak. The, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, you know? And um, that it's more about your heart. It's more about where your heart is rather than the actual sin itself. Maybe that's the point. So you know what? I will wrap it up there before I put my foot any further in my mouth. Hopefully this challenges some of you out there to, to just ask the question. Consider that maybe. Because that's one thing I do believe that it's, it's a, it's a repentance isn't even the word. It's a heart thing, right? If you don't even care enough to feel repentant, if you don't care enough to be bothered to try, then to me, it's not about the sin anymore. It's about your heart. You're already distant from God, right? So you could be sitting there saying how you love the Lord and all this stuff and, you know, you're far away from him and both God and Yeshua make statements to that effect, right? You honor, honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me, right? On that note, I, that's it. I'm wrapping it up. I promise. So thank you for sticking it out to this point in the video. If you did, um, I would ask if you can give it a like, if you liked it. Um, share with others. We like to spread this message as much as we can. And if you have not subscribed, feel free to do so and hit the notification bell, whichever platform you might be on. I'm sure there's some method of being notified when content goes up. So I would encourage you to do that to make sure that you don't miss any of the uploads that Ray or I do. And having said that, I do wish you all blessings in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Lord. And I say Shalom which means peace, that also means lacking nothing. It's a completeness, and that completeness brings peace. So lacking nothing, peace, shalom. Bye for now. You've been watching Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. If you have a comment, please leave it on the bottom of this video or email us at truthandtestimonyemail at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Truth and Testimony, the broadcast is not affiliated with Truth and Testimony magazine.